Hello, friends, and welcome to the Wisdom for Life broadcast. This is Pastor Glenn with another episode that we hope will bless you. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 21, verse 5. And uh, we are going to talk about meekness this morning. We have been comparing fruit to feelings and how we live from the inside out, not the outside in. We have an internal power that is internal and that God fuels us spiritually from the inside out. And so we don't react to our circumstances, our surroundings. We are proactive by the Spirit of God as He empowers us to do so. And specifically this morning, we're going to be comparing meekness and comparing that in contrast to weakness. Meekness is not weakness. Now, I gave you an overall, kind of an overreaching text for the entire series, and that is in Galatians 5.22. You don't have to turn there, just stay where you're at, Matthew. Uh, Galatians 5.22 says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, and temperance, or self-control. Meekness is square in the middle. It begins with love, and it ends with self-control. I want to tell you, meekness is strength that begins with love that is always under control. Imagine the strongest person you've ever met, and now imagine that person always under God's control and obedient to the Father. And now you have a picture of Jesus. The strongest person that ever lived, the mightiest person that ever walked the face of the earth, was meek. Second only to, uh, well, actually, the second to him would be Moses, who was very strong, very bold, but the Bible says was meek. God wants you to grow in meekness. Let's look at the text here, Matthew 21, 5. It says, tell the daughters of Zion, behold, the king, who's the king? Jesus, right? Hello. Good morning, church. Who is it? It's not Burger King. It's Jesus. He comes unto you, how? Meek. They don't show up that way. Presidents don't show up that way. Leaders don't show up that way. He comes to you, meek, sitting upon a donkey. It goes a little bit farther. And it says, and on a colt, the fold. Now that's a female animal here of a donkey. So here's how he rides into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. He rides in, not on a white horse. This is how Herod would ride in. He would get on a white horse, he would ride in, and everybody would just cheer and clap because this is how a conquering leader, this is how a great leader of great statue, uh, stature would strut himself around. Jesus doesn't come in on a white horse. He comes in on a female donkey. He comes in representing peace. While, at the same time, ironically, he has all the power in the universe. Yet he comes in, meek and mild, on a female donkey. Now, he's not coming back that way. You know, we heard in Sunday school this morning, Revelation chapter 19, he he won't be coming back on a donkey. You know, I see a cute little donkey with long ears, you know. I know they're supposed to go up, but, you know, just kind of long-eared, floppy-eared donkey. You know, just sweet and mild. He's not coming back that way. How many of you know you can go to Taco Bell and you got the mild sauce and then you got the hot sauce? He started with the mild sauce. He's coming back with the hot sauce. Amen. Come on. The Bible says he'll come back on a white horse. The reason being is he's going to conquer. Amen. But meekness is the way he chose to come first. Why? Because he wanted to be under the Father's submission. He wanted that power to be under control so that he might connect love to you And I, would you pray with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to be like your son. We want to be mighty through your spirit, yet meek as well. We we want our character to be meek, and we want the spirit within us to be mighty, but completely under the control of the Almighty. We give you the praise for that as a church. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Go with me, Mr. Peabody, in your way back machine. We are going back to the late 70s. There is a TV show that if you missed this show, I don't know what you were doing, but it was called The Incredible Hulk. Come on. You were there. I was there for all you youngsters. 
Listen, you got Marvel today. Listen, you, we didn't have a real look, big, giant CGI looking Hulk. Amen. We had Lou Ferrigno with green chalk dust all over him. Come on, that's what we had. So come on, you don't remember this? Now, it all started out with this guy by the name of David Banner, played by Bill Bixby, the biggest wimp the earth has ever seen. And he used to make this statement. He used to say, come on. He used to make this statement. He'd say, don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. And then when he became angry, look out. His clothes would burst off his body. But, you know, conveniently, his, his jeans turned into jean shorts. I don't know how that happened, but he would, he, this would all be covered. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <sighs> Made for a good TV show. It's all in the script, right? That's what we say at our house. All in the script. But here's the deal. Anybody made him mad, he would lose total control. Isn't that, isn't that how life is today? If there's a spectrum of how things are, we go from zero to 100 in like three milliseconds. You know? There I was dialed down to one, but I'm at 10. I'm dialed up to 10 in anger overnight, completely ready to have what I think is righteous indignation to release wrath on anybody that would even dare disagree with me on Facebook. How dare you? How dare you? Like, like this isn't a world full of different opinions. I know, they're like noses and something else. But here's the deal. Everyone's got one. And if you disagree with my opinion, I am going to turn into the Incredible Hulk. Now, when I was a kid, I so identified with the Incredible Hulk, I had my parents go out and buy me the underoos. Come on, you wore them, I wore them. Underoos. You know, and I even had the footy pajamas of the Incredible Hulk. You know, the ones you could slide into the kitchen on? Those were fantastic. Later on, now this doesn't make sense, but later on, I got the, I got the Incredible Hulk Shrinky Dinks. Remember the Shrinky Dinks? Now this doesn't make sense. It start out a big Hulk, you put it in the oven, and it would shrink up to like almost nothing, a little Hulk. That doesn't make sense. But I wanted it. I wanted to identify with strength. I wanted to identify with power. So does everybody. But that's the way of the world. It's not just strength, and it's not just power, and it's not just might but it's under control and obedient and submissive to God. That's the way of Christ. So don't get the impression this morning that God is calling you to be a doormat. Don't get the impression this morning that God's calling you to be a heel. But God is calling you to walk in boldness and in His strength and the power of His might meekly so that everything we do represents the will of the Father, not the will of me. Amen? Amen? Amen. So I want to look at this a little bit here. What is meekness? Think about this for a minute. Jesus is riding in on this cult. They say this to him they, with palm branches. They say, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna means save us now. That's what it means. It means save us now. In other words, conquer. In other words, you're coming in. We want you to be king. Don't you want Jesus to be king? Won't that make everything right? I know, it would. But that's not what he does. He doesn't make everything right in the world. He, makes, he starts with everybody's hearts. You see, ironically, in a juxtaposition, the same people just a week later say crucify. Not knowing that that's part of God's plan too. Not knowing that Jesus used both. Not knowing that Jesus would be a conqueror. But he would do it in such a meek and mild way that it would start a revolution in hearts Amen. then in the world. Wow, if we could just think the same way. Because we've had revolutions. Come on now. You say you want a revolution. Well, you know, we all want to save the world, don't we? Yeah. But we got to start the way Jesus did. So they're asking him to come in and be a conqueror. Does he show up the way they expect? No. Will he show up again the way we expect? Nuh-uh. Yeah. Nuh-uh. We're thinking Jesus is going to show up like a flannel graph. Yeah. He's going to show up with a cute little lamb. Uh-uh. He's going to show up on a white horse with a throne, or actually a sword that comes out of his mouth. It's going to be piercing, man. We have to get ready now to become like him or face the other side of the coin. How many of you know when you go to the, 
store and you buy something with a $20 bill, how many of you know that on the other side of that bill is another side? Could you purchase something with just one side? See, 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 we don't, we truncate the gospel. We limit the gospel. We cut off the other side of the gospel. We have one side of the gospel that says Jesus loves you, but we've also got the other side of the gospel that says Jesus must be Lord. Yes, he comes to you meekly, but he will also come back mighty. Yes, he, yes, he loves you but at the same, and, and wishes to save you, but at the same time, he is just. He's not just loving, he's just. Let's say it again. He's not just loving, he's just. And he's going to judge the world. So there's two sides to the gospel. And make sure the world gets both. See, I don't want to be so accommodating that I tell people that Jesus is so in love with them that he doesn't mind that they continue in their sin. Are you awake this morning? Amen. Yeah. We don't want a Jesus that is out of control with his strength, but at the same time, we need a Jesus that will conquer this world. We do. And that's what shows up in meekness. So what is meekness? Let's take a look at it here. The Greek word in the New Testament is pros, it means power, write this down, power under control. A couple of ideas here to illustrate would be this. This would be the demeanor or the stance of a war horse. Now, have you ever ridden a horse before that, like, you know, of course, of course, right? You've ridden a horse. I'm asking, not rhetorical, please. Have you ridden? Oh, great. I never get, every time we go horseback riding, they always put me on a mule. Don't they, honey? Don't they? I don't know why. I mean, I'm, I'm losing weight. I'm trimming everything. They never put me on one of the horses. They always put me on a mule, don't we? We've gone multiple times. It's like, oh, you. You will save you for last. You get the mule. So I've never been on a horse. I want to. Anybody got one? You, you do? Call me over. We're going we're gonna, to. Will you let me ride? Will you promise I won't die? So the idea here is a war horse trained for battle. Listen, power under reign, under control. Imagine that, bi- that bridle, bridle, if you will. That bridle um, responds to the tiniest little pulls. The tiniest little pulls. It, it's, are we so receptive to the Holy Spirit that it dis- just takes a nudge? Or does God have to dig in his, his spurs to slow you down? He's given you an endowment of power that's promised in Acts. But are you using that power in such a way that it does not reflect the will of the Father? It reflects the will of you. In those cases, God would have to go, whoa. He doesn't want to dig in spurs. He wants you to respond to his spirit by little movements of the reins. Little movements of the reins. Other times, God wants you to get going, you know? And instead of, again, whipping you, he just doesn't have a desire to whip you. That's not, his, that's not his character. It's not his spirit. But he does want you to run because you were born to run. <laughs> Sorry. You're born to run. You were endued with power, not just to sit, but to run. And he wants you to get going. So if you learn to be responsive to the spirit, learn to see that power. Now respond to the reins. Here's the other idea. Um, you know how horses, they, they know that they're, they're being ridden and they know there's a direction. And what's really interesting is, is the rides I've been on, even though I'm on a mule, um, they kind of know the path. They can take it kind of on their own. But when they get ready, you, you'll see them start to kind of clop their, click their heels a little bit. They're just excited, but they don't move forward. They don't move forward until, until, because the, of the meekness, until... There's instruction to do it. And so when the father comes along and he says, by the spirit, now's the time. Let's run. Well, you might click your heels. You might clop at the ground a little bit. But when God says, go, come on, church, let's go. Come on. Did did you drink any coffee this morning? Come on. (laughs) Yeah, I know you did, Bill. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. This is is the, the idea... This is the idea of power under control. And the Bible says that Jesus had the power of the Spirit without limit. But I want you to see in the divine attributes of God, His immutability, He couldn't sin. 
He was without sin, but he also couldn't sin. His omnipresence, he could be everywhere, yet chose to be in just one place at one time. Think about these divine attributes. His omniscience, he knows all things, and yet he grew in stature and in wisdom with man. Come on, are you listening this morning? His omnipotence, and, but yet he allowed himself in the hypostatic union to be confined to flesh and then appear as a baby. Amen. That's meekness. Amen. But yet still fully divine. Yeah. Do you see the self-limiting kenosis of Christ in the fact that this is the way he shows up all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Boom, shaka, laka, laka, man. Amen. Fullness. And yet, self limiting. What does the Father require next? What does the Father want next? I only do what I see the Father doing. He could have called 10,000 angels. He could have, in that moment, in the week leading up to the cross, conquered the world. Amen. Satan tried to offer him something that was already. His by the cross that we had given up. And yet he didn't. He held back. He had the power, but he held back. Kept it under control. Moses was the same way. The Bible describes him in Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, that he was the meekest man on earth at the time. I think there's a great contrast between the Hebrew word for meekness and the Greek word. The Hebrew word for meekness is amvana. Sounds like a salad, but you know, just put a little dressing on it, Thousand Island or something. Avana. What is avana? It means to be humble enough to know your place. Amen. Anybody know their place? Yeah. This, ha this happened to me one time as a pastor, one time. And ever since then, I, I just look back to it, and I'm just like, thank God I know my place. Okay, you know what my place is? Not the head of the church. Woohoo! You know how liberating that is? Do you, know, do you know how much weight falls off of me when I say, I'm not in charge, he is? I can say that all the time. Well, Pastor, I got a problem with something. Well, Jesus is in charge. Have you talked to him? Nope. <laughs> Pretty slick, huh? I got 50 ways. Think about it. Think about this for a minute. He's the head. I'm not. I'm just servant. Like you. Do I have a responsibility? Yes, but under him, I know my place. That's liberating. It's, hum it's humility. Moses, time after time, he didn't fight for the authority that he had. He didn't fight for his position. Miriam and Aaron did. They weren't meek. They had these Issues, time and time again, we're looking for ways to say, why him, God? Why him? Why not us as well? Don't we prophesy? Don't we have these gifts? You know, why should he be in charge? Do you realize that in that story, Moses never went before him and, said, and fought and said, hey, we're going to have an argument. I'm the boss. I'm the boss. Do you know what the, the weakness is and the failure and, and uh, let's see how... It, uh, the, the risk of that is, it's simply this. When you have to tell somebody you're the boss, you're not. It's like the parent in the mall that counts to three. I'm going to count to three for the third time. You're not in charge. Are you hearing me? If i got to yell to you or I've got to say I'm in charge, I'm not. Right? There's something about just quietly trusting God and knowing just to be the person that walks the slowest in the room. I'm not, I'm not worried about it. God's in control. He's the one in charge. And the only controlling spirit is the Holy Spirit. And we're not too worried about it, are we? Now that's the person in charge. And you know what's really kind of cool about that? They don't even want to be in charge. <laughs> so there's nothing you can do to them. You ever thought that through? The most dangerous leader you'll ever have is the one that really doesn't want to lead in the first place. But he does it because he wants to serve and he loves God. That's dangerous. Because the ones that really want to lead and want to say that they're the boss and they want to fight all the time about it, well, you got their buttons. But this is a buttonless person. You can't press a guy's buttons that don't have any buttons. <laughs> I like what I'm preaching this morning. I'm about to get saved. This is fantastic, man. 
Sarah, did you write this? Awesome, honey. It's not in my notes. So what does Moses do? He says, look, I know my place. I'm not worried about it. God's in charge of this million or some say a million, some say four million. Amen. They're messing up all the time. They're complaining all the time. They're upset all the time. They're constantly uh, bickering and complaining and, and causing fights. And it sounds like church. And you know what he keeps doing? He just keeps remaining meek. He keeps, well, there's one time where he strikes the rock twice when he's told to speak to it. But other than that, let's give Moses a break. Amen. Moses is just like God's in charge. He's the one that's leading. I'm his servant. And as long as he wants me to do this, I'll do it. And the minute he doesn't want me to do it, he brought me in this world, he can take me out. I'm good. Think about that. That's meekness. That's saying God gave me the power to use. I'm going to use it to bless people. And if it, if it ain't working, then, then he can give me different power. And if it, or he can cause someone else to lead. That's just fine with me. Amen. <laughs> and the Bible says that he was meek. Does that mean that he was, does that, listen, does that mean that he was weak? Oh, no, this is the same guy that stands before Pharaoh, the then emperor and, and in charge person of the world, and brings down ten plagues. You've never seen anything like this. Amen. Anything like this. Amen. This is the same guy that deals with a, a million to four million people at, on any given day. Yes, later he talks to Father Jethro, Father Wisdom. That's the, what the word Jethro means. Uh, it's... <laughs> It's not the Dukes of Hazard, Jethro, okay? It's a, are you, okay. It, 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 it's, it's Father Wisdom, and he says, hey, you might want to break this up into groups, and you might want to have 50, and you might want to have 100, and, and they'll be under different people. And uh, Moses says, sounds like a great plan. I'll delegate because I'm meek. I'll trust other people with authority because I'm meek. Because I love to see God's power displayed only if it gives God power and only if it gives God glory and only if it empowers his people. I've seen and heard people in conferences compare Jesus and Moses to, to CEOs, and that is a terrible comparison. Amen. Greatest leaders that ever hit the planet, but they were not CEOs. They were not chief executive officers. Walking around with titles. Walking around with orders and commands. These were people that served. It was an upside-down kingdom that Jesus brought. Amen. The first were last. Everything was paradoxically the other way around. And that's why the Pharisees couldn't get it. That's why most of the religious world wouldn't receive it. But that's why the common man could be saved by it. Amen. So he, runs, he, he, he comes in and he says, yeah, I'm going to save the world. But, but I'm not going to do it the way you think. With all of this might, I'm going to do it with meekness. Amen. And he shows up that way. Is there any... Is there any other reason why you should serve him and not any other God? Amen. There's plenty of reasons, but the greatest is this. He had all of the power in the world to make you serve him. But instead, through meekness and love, he says, would you serve me? Wow. I love him. I love him. Am I alone? Just tell him. Just say, I love you. I love you. Hallelujah. Praise the name of God. What is this, uh, Ivana? In the Old Testament, what's the picture like? To know, to be meek enough to know your place. And then proos in the New Testament. The idea here, it's power under control. Let me give you another kind of example that maybe bridges the two ideas here. Um, imagine, if you will, uh, and I'm stealing this illustration. Okay to steal an illustration or two? Okay, this is, this is Pastor uh, uh, Rutland. But, but, but anyway, uh, he says it's like this. It's like this. Imagine a lioness with her cubs. These, these cubs start to, as they're growing, they start to nip and they start to bite at each other. They're playing. There's this moment where you look at that and you say, oh, that's so cute. Look at those pretty little kitties. I wonder if they purr. And then you realize that those kitties could probably take your hand off. You know, they, they probably could. But they're nipping and they're biting. They don't have all the power they could have yet. But in those moments, they're just being playful. And you say, pretty kitty, pretty <laughs> kitty. And I want you to see their mother now. You know, you just don't, in the animal kingdom and in the human kingdom, you mess with mama's cubs, you're going to get ate, eaten. You guys, you guys love my wife. I mean, I, I, I can tell you do. You say, oh, she's so sweet and stuff. You don't know the other side. 
You don't have any idea. I almost, I chuckle. I chuckle when I go home because it's like, boy, don't, they don't have a clue. Because, <laughs> hey, it's St. Patrick's Day. She's Irish. All right, 100%. Wait a minute, 75% Irish, 25% German. Explosive combination in this woman. Comes from like a, the, Myrish, the Irish mob, the Myrish mob, yeah. From Chicago, crazy, yeah, whole family. I didn't, know, I didn't know I'd live this long, you know, but I'm here, I'm married to, I'm serious, man, it's for real. But here's the deal, she's always sweet, always kind, always nice, until like somebody does something with one of our kids, and then good Lord, I'm just like, I'm trying everything I can to, and she's, she likes to wrestle. You don't, you don't, yeah. She, she'll tell me things. She'll just be like, honey, let's wrestle. You don't understand. That doesn't mean what you think it is. It's, she wants to physically harm me. She does like that. She, I married a tomboy. I love that. I mean, I just, you know, I didn't want somebody I could just like control or whatever. I wanted a little pushback. Oh boy, did I get it. But imagine those cubs, if you will. Those cubs, they're just, they're just, they're just, you know, just kind of biting each other and slapping around and that sort of. They don't really have all of their, all of their claws in yet. Everything's going to be fine. All right? Imagine that for a minute. That's not meekness. Because, because power hasn't entered, entered the equation yet. Not enough power. Until power enters the equation, we don't have meekness. We just have weakness. Meekness is when power is in the equation, and yet at the same time, it's, such, it's under such control that no one is hurt. Now imagine mama picking one of those cubs up in her jaws. And she has enough power in her jaws to end life just with a, just with a flinch. And yet she reserves it and controls it enough that she's able to save her cubs from danger. And now you're getting the picture of the power of the Holy Spirit in you as it develops meekness. Amen. It's not weak. It's power yeah. under control to bless Amen. and help and love. Amen. Maybe I could put it a couple of other ways, and we'll close with some prayer. I got a whole lot of stuff. Ever go out to eat with your spouse? This is how you know you're getting older. You ever, you ever go out to eat with your spouse and sit there and go, well, now we got lunch, you know? You don't know what I'm talking about? Because they bring you these portions, and it's like, I know if I order that, I'm not going to be able to eat it all. So I got enough for, ne you know, the next day. Well, the rest of the sermon is next day, okay? And just pretend it's made of something with tomatoes, so it'll be even better. <laughs> but this is how you know you're getting older, because you only eat half your meal, you take the other half home, and you eat the rest for lunch. Come on, hallelujah. <laughs> I've graduated. Because I used to be that, you know, that sweat hog that would sit down and go, oh, that wasn't enough, man. Went out to Tony's last night, and I mean, there was a line. All the, that salad bar had a line out all the way. It was, you know, it was bad, but I endured. I endured, and we've got something to eat for lunch today. But listen, here's where I want to land. Recently, I was at Saucers. Anybody know where Saucers is at? Come on, you know where Saucers is at. The, the, the great Donald Hutton works at Saucers. Anybody know? Oh, yeah, amen. We love you. Right now he's shaking his head and he's like, wait till after service. I don't like this kind of stuff. Well, I toured the plant with him. I did. And listen, I didn't fit in at all. I didn't fit in at all, but that's okay. I was there to kind of learn. It was cool. It was awesome. He showed me the whole plant. Guys, you got to see what this, you got to see what he does. It's awesome. He goes to a customer they don't cuss, listen, they don't know what they want. They don't, uh, let me rephrase. They don't know what they need. They just try to tell Don what they want. Then he has to come back to these like 11 or 12 dudes. And he has to say, this is what the customer needs fabricated out of steel. And we've got to use all of these heavy equipment and all of these machines to shape, modify, and fabricate, weld, cut out. They have these plasma torches. I mean, it was so cool. I mean, what a time to be a dude. I was like, oh yeah. <laughs> Step into a Slim Jim. <laughs> they have these plasma torches that cut steel. I don't know how thick. It's like really thick. You got to drill this big hole first 
And then there's this pl plasma is like a hot plasma is the gas on the sun. That hot plasma is what you see in lightning. That hot. And yet he, they're cutting steel with such precision. Power under control with precision. Cutting circles out of steel that thick, man. But what tops the cake is this massive crane. And he said, do you want to try to use it, Pastor? It's way above us, higher than this ceiling. Amen. And it's got these arms, and it's got a big alarm on it and everything that moves back and forth. This thing could, I don't know, pick up how many tons? 20 tons. 20 tons. And the only thing I kept thinking of is, man, I could bring my car in here right now, and just for kicks. We could lift it up and take a picture of that. That would be awesome. <laughs> but then there was a moment where he was like, hey, do you want to try it? And then I, I, I became a little girl. I was like, no, 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 I don't want to. Now, he's had children come in. He's had children come in and operate this crane. And they're like, oh, yeah, you know, and they'll operate it. You know, they love it. But something in me was like, I'm not trained to deal with something that powerful, okay? So if you're on my side right now, you're probably thinking, thank God that Jesus obeyed his father with those 12 men, come on. And he taught those 12 men well enough to be trained to meekly take the gospel to the world, even though it would cost them their lives. The gospel got out by 12 guys and one was a betrayer. And it got out with 12. Just think of what this church could do. And it was this power under precision and control. I'm not done. I'm, I'm not done. Recently, I, I went and toured a really cool place called Val Film. Come on. Weber Santos, baby. I was in the house. It, who else? Uh, Joe Brown worked there when it was Dow Chemical. And uh, Jason Johnston took me on that tour and you know who else? Chad Lee operates one of those. In fact, I stood in front of Chad Lee's machine and ran it a little bit. I just, well, I didn't actually. I just stepped back and watched it run. But it was awesome. It was awesome. These huge machines taking um, little bits of plastic, melting it down at a high-intensity heat, then blowing air into it like blowing bubbles, and it turns into this, this stretch wrap that's amazing. But these massive machines under precision so that the temperature is just right, so that the air is blowing just right, so that it wraps around this conveyor and comes out the other side. And when's the last time you moved and you said, thank God for this saran wrap type stuff that's protecting all my stuff. Thank God for these glad trash bags. Thank God for this plastic. And well, it's made by these really powerful machines under control. Amen. Now, I want you to see the church. The church today is the most powerful force on the planet. It is not weak. Stop it with that thinking. The agent of change on planet Earth is the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. Join the church. Give God some praise. Come on. Be a part of the church. Link your life up to the church. Stop running from the church. Stop putting down the church. Stop seeing it as weak. See it as strength but meekly as we engage the world of the lost what's going to change them they'll know you're my disciples by your love all this power Amen. to transform the world and yet we engage the world not with might but boldly in love and then all the way on the other end of the spectrum of the gifts of the Spirit and the gifts or the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22, self-control. 
And right in the center, meekness. It's not weakness. It's strength. What are your strengths? What are your giftings? What does the Holy Spirit put in you? Listen, as we go to the Lord this morning in prayer, and as the worship team comes, I, listen, do not write this moment off. Some of you right now are thinking about, now what's for lunch? Stop it. Repent. Stop it. Please. Please, please, please. I don't, I don't want any other distractions. I, I'm tired of the devil distracting altar calls. I'm going to say this with authority. That's been going on in here. Do not distract this time. This is God's time. If you've never had the opportunity to be filled with the Spirit, now's your time. You say, you say it, is that going to be something that I can't control? Please, right now, I want your attention. This is God's time. This is God's time. Remember, one of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. You're not going to be out of control. You're going to be more meek. This is the problem I have with hyper-Pentecostalism. Listen to me carefully. We think it's being out of control. You're never more in control than when you're filled with the Holy Ghost. You're never more full of the power of God, but per with precision than when you have the Spirit of God. You never more have an opportunity to do great things for the Lord, but meekly and in love with peace and with joy than when you have the Spirit of the living God. Jesus said to Christians, believers, He said, tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power. Endowment means to put on. It means to to wear this morning, some of you wore green, some of you didn't. On the way out, pinch those people. <laughs> In a godly place, like right here. Uh, pinch those people. You're endued, though, with the Spirit. You're clothed with power. Yet, meekly and in love, we use that power to engage people that are hurting, people that are broken, people that need the love and the light of Jesus Christ. If you've never asked God to fill you with the Holy Spirit, would you today, would you give us an opportunity to just pray with you? Could I have my elders, their wives, perhaps some folks to come and pray with me? Right now, please.